Yeah. We're talking 30 years ago. Sorry, we're talking more like 35 years ago because the band started in May 1979. It's 35 years. It's a real one strike at line, that. It's written on bass, actually, not on guitar. It's got a harmonic there. It, it started uh, me and Colin, uh, the singer, we... Uh, we joined together and played every Thursday at the Cricketers' Arms Hotel in Melbourne. Oh, they had a few songs. I mean, Down Under was already written. They used to play Down Under acoustically here without the flute part. It had already been, they'd already started playing it. I heard it at, um, a couple of times and it, had, it was about 20 minutes long, a real long song. Because um, Ron had that little ba bass line go ding, 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 that sort of thing, the Ron strike it line. And, um, that became a bass line, which here it's part the start of the song. And uh, the song just evolved, I suppose. So yeah, we, it was in, in here, just across here. So where was the stage? Stage? Oh. <laughs> there was no stage, it was just on the floor. We just set up on the floor here. We, we started playing here every Thursday night and it just built and built and built. It was a huge night. It was unbelievable. The whole place would just pack out with people, uh, which didn't take much because it was a small place, but they'd be sort of up one end, you know, by the, the window, you know, near the road. And um, every night uh, we'd go to see them, we would be all hanging out for Down Under. I would come up quite often with, uh, music in a form that wasn't complete uh, and I would start playing something and, and Colin would tune in because we were both uh, playing guitars and we were both really good at rhythm. We had a combination that you couldn't unglue. Yeah, that, that really keyed it in. Uh, the dun da da dun da dun da dun da um, I had a cassette, you know, four track and so I wanted to throw in some percussions. I looked in the kitchen, pots and pans, dish rack, anything I could find, bang, 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 make some noise, and there it was. And I taped it, and I played it to him, and we, we got going with it and took it further and added more, and then he came in with the words. Down under the single, I've got the seven inch one. That's a classic case of something that's kind of not produced. It may be a little bit. Everyone's thought about the arrangement of the song, and it's true to what the band do live. Like it is, a, it's a fine version of the song, but it's not the hit version. It's nowhere near the hit version in a whole lot of ways. And those ways, I've always thought it was Peter uh, Peter McKean, who McKean, I think it was, who did the. Um, who did the production. He took him into a normal commercial studio, a couple of weeks, and every song just turned into a sort of snappy three or four minute pop single, none more so than Down Under. Um, he rearranged the song, took bits out and some of the, the flute part, the controversial flute part, which prominent, is, features prominently in the original version. <laughs> Oh, he made that more prominent. <laughs> Listen to the original version, the other thing too is the vocals. I like the 
hit version was just big chorusy, really, really good uh, vocals. She said, Do you come from a land down under? The very opening notes to it with Jerry Spicer doing, do, 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 you know, like, how great is that? It was recorded with, with bottles, as in the video at the beginning. That's exactly what, what was done. Yeah, we fill put water in and hit it and and uh, poured water out and till we got the right uh, tones. Mm. <laughs> As a band, we used to like to uh, write our own videos or write our own sort of scripts for the film we're going to do. It's all very strange to look at it now. You know, it's been over 30 years since we shot this video. This combi belonged to the camera system. With Down Under, the ideas, as far as I remember, the ideas came very solidly from the band. The Strange Lady was a friend of Collins, who was an acting student at the time, I believe. I can't remember her name. I should, but I can't. I'm sorry. Uh, the guy with the sold sign is Russell Deppler, the manager of Men at Work at the time, uh, who was an old university friend of Collins and Ron's, I believe. That's what was great working with the men because they were such great performers and they love theatre. They love, you know, costumes and that sort of stuff. So did we, you know, we thought that was great. The man with the Vegemite sandwich is Jerry Spicer, the drummer from uh, Men at Work. And it was very gooey with that Vegemite sandwich. Everyone got Vegemite all over them. And then all this beer that was floating around here. It was, um, some glasses broke. I remember there was broken glass at one point. Everyone was just covered in beer. So this is what I just kept as one, one shot. I had it all cut into little pieces, but I just left it as one shot and I thought it looked really good like that because of the choreography. The five of them just doing this fabulous stuff again. And off they bounce. That's great. This is my favourite sequence in the video, the sort of them all in the white with the poor old roadies carrying everything behind in black. And uh, it wasn't very pleasant. If you look really closely, there's this really fine layer of sand um, just coming up into their faces. And it, I had to get them to do it another time and another time. And Colin was so pissed off. Said, this is really hurting my fucking eyes. We had to do this again. This is really shitting me. I said, yeah, we've got to do it one more time. Quick. Yeah, I know. Tony and I used to carry on about how it was sort of probably the most seen music video in Australian music history. Probably still is, but who knows. Well, it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a sort of quirky song, had a good video, as well as um, it was pushed very well by the record companies. But then we had the America's Cup sort of phenomenon, which has happened in, what, 83, and that, um, that just took the record to another, to another level. <laughs> Good afternoon. Australia 2 has done the impossible. It's won the America's Cup. The crew just got up every morning and put the record on. I think it played it because it kept them moving and they loved the, the energy. Now, whenever the boat left in the morning, we'd have the boxing kangaroo flag flying with great pride and men at work down under, blaring for all the Americans to hear. Have you heard the results, morning? Yes, and I'm proud to be in Australia. It became more of a prop, sort of, you know, linking it with a pride pride of being Australian and beating the Americans at their racing and being such a good crew and doing such a good job on the water. And then the song was sort of like strong and strident. We had Bob Hawke, you know, offering everybody to have a holiday. And... I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up today is a bum. <laughs> it was like it's that real moment of sort of bringing everybody together.
next thing it's become a, a sort of like a sports anthem over the you know over the next decades even now I just watch the co events at the Commonwealth Games I can't remember what event it was but you know Australia won and then they played down in That song just encapsulated uh, that sense of overseas adventure of young Australians and in a way that nothing else had ever done before. Uh, people were writing songs about Australia uh, when Skyhooks in the mid-70s started writing songs about suburban Melbourne. That was a, a real breakthrough. And here was men at work uh, writing songs about West Australians having a good time with young people travelling the world. And it resonated. Um, and it's really become our probably second national song after Waltzing Matilda. Uh, and it's one that's instantly recognisable by any Australian anywhere. And I think even recognised to some extent overseas as that, uh, as that Australian song. A lot of people have fond memories of that song, whether you love it as a song or not. It just was part of an Australian situation. I remember I was travelling through Poland in the mountains on a dark, cold night in this funny little car. A fellow was driving me and he, he switched his radio and it came on. <laughs> oh, yeah, I lo loved it. it catchy and it was, it was just everywhere, you know. It's just one of those songs that was everywhere, so undeniable. It's got chander in it and, you know, Vegemite. I mean, what can you say? No, it is, it's cute. It's a perfect Aussie little song. It's just one of those ones that just works. Have a listen to this, name the Australian nursery rhyme this riff has been based on, as well as the name of the man playing it. It's Men at Work. Men at Work it's, Down it's, Under. It's, it's Greg Ham is the floaters. Greg yes. Ham of Men at Work, yes. yes. And Down Under is... Oh. No! We don't know the rhyme. That riff has been based oh. on a nursery rhyme. Alright, I'll give you one more listen to it. This bit especially. Kookaburra is sitting in the old gum tree. That's exactly oh. right. Anyway, Speaks and Specs brought it up and said, I didn't, wouldn't watch it, but some, some segment on this show is saying, look, isn't this just like the Kookaburra song? Next thing you know. It's one of the most iconic Australian pop songs of all time, but now a legal spat has broken out over whether the Men at Work song Down Under is actually a rip-off of a children's song. Greg Hamm was very good with his keyboards, uh, saxophone, flute, clarinet, even like uh, when we had rehearsals or something, he would just jam uh, on certain instruments and we go, hey, that's, that's getting good, that, keep that one. I think Colin was really upset that anyone would think that he would consciously steal something. He really didn't want, he didn't want to say, uh, you know, I copied this. That was one thing. Um, he'd written the song, it didn't have the flute line in it when he wrote it. He performed it for years, he performed it later without the flute line. For him, it wasn't, the flute line wasn't part of the song. And the song was the thing that he'd written and he didn't want to, he didn't want to say, oh yeah, okay, I, I pinched it. I will refer to the video in more detail below, but it is sufficient for present purposes to say that it included a shot of Mr. Ham playing the flute riff in the middle of the song, while sitting in a tree playing to a koala in a hangman's noose. In, in the case, they sort of tried to use that as a, um, oh, did as they? a reference for the kookaburra being up in the old gum tree. Yeah, I don't know. It sounds like they were going up a tree, right? Trying to bark up the wrong tree. It was just, uh, you know, Greg said it was a good idea to sit in the tree. It had nothing to do with the kookaburra. Greg in the tree, the offending shot. Um, my recollection of it is we were so far behind. That day had been a terrible day shooting. It was driving wind, sand in everybody's face. There was a lot to do. And we just ran out of time at the end of the day. 
and there was nowhere else to do that, to get a different looking thing to the sand hills than the mangrove swamp across the road. It wasn't resolved early on. I think in a lot of those cases, uh, you know, probably um, the head of EMI and the head of Larrikin sort of just sat down and said, I didn't pick this up, you didn't pick it up, you know, we'll work out a, we'll work out a deal. Yeah, uh, one of our differences was that um, the first affidavit that I read um, was suggesting that the flute line was the hook of the song. And then I think Andrew Ford described what a hook is and how, how it works in pop music and how it's the thing that makes you want to hear the song again or recognise the song or buy the song. Um, <clears throat> and again, I just found myself not really agreeing with that uh, on the level that I thought if there's a hook to this song, it's probably the line of lyric and vocal saying, I come from a land down under. I think what uh, seems to have got under a lot of people's skin about this is that Larrikin hadn't moved on this copyright issue, hadn't even probably perhaps noticed it until it came to the attention, their attention on the ABC on Spicks and Specs. And therefore, that's why Colin Hay says this is just opportunistic greed. You know, since we bought this copyright in 1990, my job has been a slow, steady slog of finding all of those people that have, that have used Kookaburra under the mistaken idea that it's in the public domain. What sort of damages are you seeking? Look, there have been all kinds of figures bandied around. I've heard 40 to 60 per cent. I don't think it'll go anywhere near that. Can I tell you from day one what, what I thought it should be, which was a figure around 25 per cent. 25 per cent of yeah. all the royalties of Down Under? 25 per cent. Look, I don't know how aggressive music sales were intending to be with this song. They paid $5,000 for it. They knew supposedly. They knew that it was being used and it had potential. Uh, that was their business to, to follow through. Um, I don't know if they were particularly concerned about the girl guides using it and bushwalkers using it, but obviously there was a pot of money somewhere from men at work using it, and that's what they do. If, if, a, if a musical line is a sentence and the musical phrase is a phrase in that sentence, the Kookaburra song goes... So the phrase is the first phrase of a sentence. In Down Under, the flute line goes... That little phrase that we're talking about is the second phrase of a sentence. And because of that, you hear it differently, I think. It's, it's almost disguised. But not, not once did I ever hear anybody say, oh, that shouldn't be there, or we'll get caught, or this is from that song, or it was just a perfectly innocent little... Well, it was a nod towards the song and its Australian origin and its roots. It's so cruel in many ways to some bastard to launch a legal action on that basis, really. Because if that's not a harmless use, I mean, it's... Well, it's not just a harmless use, it's a good use of it, you would have thought in some ways. Keeping it alive, adding it to an Australian icon, I don't know. Oh, he's pretty upset about it. That, that, that it was happening in the first place. And um, I, I think he was looking forward to his day in court, but um, I, I get that he had the opportunity but didn't take it, so I'm, I really don't know what happened there. Now, the way it works in those court cases, if someone makes an allegation and you have someone who can rebut that, 
and you do not call them, then the court will infer that the truth of that allegation, because you didn't you didn't call the person to rebut it. So they will just assume, well, you couldn't have rebutted it. Reading this bit of the transcript, I'm kind of embarrassed at how I'm... I'm really, at this point in the, tr in the trial and the evidence that I gave, I'm, tr I'm squirming a bit because Lancaster, their lawyer, the music sales barrister, is trying to get me to agree <laughs> that um... and many of the notes from that integrated passage have come directly from Kookaburra of course yes uh, so I'm, I'm having to agree with these things he says Kookaburra plays an important indeed essential function in that flute line and that musical element I say yes now, if you make the assumption that I've asked you to make that the flute line was intended to inject a, an Australian flavour to the song, that, then you would accept, wouldn't you, that when the second bar is played in example E, that that, that injects an Australian flavour? Yes. And its Australianness comes from the fact that it is the tune of Kookaburra, doesn't it? Yes. So I... Oh. References to the quintessentially Australian appear all throughout the song in its lyrics. Yes. And all throughout the song in its video. Yes. And it wouldn't be any surprise if that same reference to Australianness occurs musically now, would it? Mm, it wasn't a good moment. I have come to the view that the 1979 recording and the 1981 recording of Down Under infringe Larrikin's copyright in Kookaburra. In the song? Like, did, what do you mean? did Greg know that it was Kookaburra? Possibly. I think we talked about it at rehearsals because we were, you know, going over bits and pieces to put in the song. Because we had um, Den in Bombay who used to play the Snake Charmers um, theme there, you know. I think I think it's called something else, like the harem dance or something. But that was thrown in there in the middle of it, and then we threw some other Australiana in there to honour any kind of snippets of Australiana that we threw in. I agree that I think a quotation or a tribute or a homage, if you like, where you quote from the culture you grew up on is entirely natural and spontaneous and proper and it reinforces, it celebrates the culture, it's, it's culture making. And I grew up on that song. I mean, at school we sang this song till day and night. It just goes into you, it's, it belonged to us all. It is a very key practice that goes on in all fields of the arts where we draw on material that's come before us um, and reflect on it. Sometimes that's directly in terms of things like, you know, criticism um, or educational context where you quote from somebody's work and you build on it. But in other ways, it's actually like quite a deliberate attempt to simply use the cultural references around you as raw material to make your own statement, your, make your own kind of ideas around uh, the world and how you experience it. Well, it, yeah, honours the song, takes the song to, a, to an audience without being um, possessive of it, you know. We don't own, own, own Kookaburra and we're just being proud of it being, proud of Australia, really. What I would have thought, and I think Greg thought, was it was just public domain. It was just like a folk song, click go the shears, boys. We never, he, Greg Ham would have never thought for a moment that that was in copyright, nor would have I. The very person who wrote it was, she would have heard Down Under. It's very unlikely that she wouldn't have recognised part of her song in the song, in the song Down Under. But she chose to do nothing about it because I think she had a generosity of spirit that the people who enacted the court case didn't. She died in 1987 and that's like, we recorded the song way back in 1980, I think, first time. She would have heard it and by 83 she would have heard it somewhere. 
and she didn't jump up and down. Marion Sinclair, who wrote the Kookaburra song, clearly really thought of music as a kind of clear, a collective shared experience. I mean, her whole practice in relation to how she actually dealt with Kookaburra was all about getting it out there, making sure that people are actually were singing it, that people are enjoying themselves with music. And so for her, it was really about connecting people and community, whereas the case is really about closing everything down and you can't touch it without permission. It was fascinating to, to be close to this, to see it. It was sort of like watching a disaster from close up. And you didn't know it was a disaster until, until the end. You know, it was like watching this thing, juggernaut, this massive machine sort of rolling on and really sweeping all these people into it. Well, I was concerned about that, you know, concerned about Greg being left on his own, really, virtually, in some ways, because he had, he had the pressure of trying to work out all the the details in some ways. A post-mortem examination of the body of men at work musician Greg Hamm has found his death was not suspicious. The 58-year-old's body was found at his Carlton home yesterday morning. Friends say the plagiarism case involving the band's hit song Down Under had devastated him and he was struggling to come to terms with it in the months before his death. Yeah, well, it knocked him around a bit. It, it... It's just another, was another nail in his coffin because he had a few other nails going as well, you know. So it, it, I wouldn't say it, it was the cause of his death, but it certainly um, contributed. Only a couple of times um, talked to Greg. He was always under pressure when I talked to Greg. Um, would have liked to have visited him more. I didn't, didn't see him enough and one of those... Um, guilt things you have in life, you know, you think a good friend you didn't see, you know. It's um, very sad he's gone. He was a good, um, good fellow. I think the, the, the basis of, of the success of our music is, is that melody, is that the melodies that are in the songs are a universal thing. I think that's the important thing about music. It's melodies that people can remember and sing along, and that's the essence of the, of, of the, uh, of the best songs that we've got. An A minor, G, A minor. So that's pretty much the the verse. Fine bread from a man in Brussels, F G, A minor. He was six foot, G four and full of A minor muscles, F G. A minor. I said, do you G speak of my language? A minor. F G. A minor. He just smiled and G gave me a Vegemite. A minor sandwich. F G. And he said, now he goes C major chord. Do you come from a G land down under? A minor. F, G, C, for women, G, glow and men plunder, A minor, F, G, C, can you hear, can you, G, hear the thunder, A minor, F, G, you, C, better run, you better take, G, cover, A minor, That's it. You now know all the chords for this song. It's a really easy song.